Thanks very much for having me here. It's really good to be back at MIT after very many years and interesting to see how the place really hasn't changed that much in a lot of ways other than the buildings have gotten better, I've seen. Um, I'm part of the team at Thomson Reuters that looks for new content sets, trying to find new pieces of information that will explain things that couldn't be explained before, surfacing new opportunities and also surfacing new risks. And we serve customers who participate throughout the financial system, traders, investors, wealth managers, bankers, and a growing number of risk managers who are trying to understand what are all the things that they're exposed to. And coming from that perspective, I have the, the great opportunity to go around and meet with people all over the world and see what these different kinds of trading and investment strategies are. And there are very many of them. And there are a lot of creative ways that you can make money off the markets. And it's also important to realize that there's other people who are viewing the world in a very different way. So, you know, we had originally come from a much smaller, bottom up, micro view, company earnings valuation, the classic quant modeling that's out there. But that's not necessarily what is driving financial systems at any given point in time. You know, we saw in 2008 that there's this top-down view that matters quite a bit. When there's a macro crisis, particularly if it's global, your trading system better account for that or you've got some real surprises that are coming. But there are other influences as well, and I've put this map together trying to gather many different pieces of information into some sort of coherent framework. One of them is definitely money flows. When you see bubbles inflating, you know, prices will go up just because people keep buying something. And you can look and see what insiders are doing, what are hedge funds doing, what are major mutual funds doing, and get some sort of sense for the money flows that are around there. Then you also have disruptive events, and these can serve as all kinds of shocks. It could just be a bankruptcy of one firm, or it could be something that starts kind of a domino effect. And we're seeing people are really interested in learning more about these different kinds of events and how you can predict them. And a lot of these big data approaches are really useful for looking at these events. Then there's the portfolio view in the middle, you know, which is great when you're in normal circumstances and minimum volatility type approaches work. But when all those correlations change, you want to see what your exposures are across the portfolio. So we've got a portfolio analytics team who are trying to understand better stress testing and scenario analytics to go with that. So our working definition of systemic risk is this all correlations go into one. And there's some nice literature reviews out there that some people on my team were happy to share with me. Basically, you've got a risky bet that has some sort of shock, and then there's contagion and amplification. I don't really understand the second parts of that so much, but I've got a pretty good understanding of risky bets and where some of these shocks can come from. And so what we're building into our scenario analysis, so going back to all those different kinds of forces that are driving markets, well, let's take a look at them. What's going on from a macro point of view? We have sovereign risk models that deal with that. What's going on with fundamentals? You know, you can see valuation ratios go up from, you know, 10 times earnings to 30 times earnings for, you know, just economic cycles going back and forth. You want to keep a, an eye on those money flows to see where massive amounts of money are going into out of the system, particularly if it's changing very rapidly. Uh, risky events, we saw some nice pictures of natural disasters before. We learned from the tsunami and earthquake in Fukushima that there's these unexpected things going on in supply chains, so we get huge demand for what's going on in relationships between companies and how do you understand that supply chain risk. And then from the portfolio view, you know, your, your relationships are only as good as the data that you put into them. And so I'm coming from a little bit of a different perspective from some people. In grad school, I studied probability theory more than statistics. And I took a Bayesian point of view of, you know, what would a person say? What's your subjective probability of something that's happening? Which gives you a little bit of suspicion about data in general. Because there's a lot of data out there. And the parts that you sample are going to give you a very different distribution. So if you're sampling a bull market, you see this upward drift. Things aren't very correlated with each other. You can take lots of different strategies that balance each other out. Then you get into a bear market or a crisis, all these correlations go to one, and oops, suddenly these things aren't canceling each other out anymore. So when we're thinking about scenario analysis, when you pluck data from different parts of this massive distribution, and I'm talking, you want to go back hundreds of years if you can. Now, unfortunately, as one of the world's largest data providers, we don't really have that. I'd love to get more of this history, and this is something that we should be building over time. But you at least want to be aware of that in your process. And I always get concerned when I see extremely complex models built on the past few years. And people coming up to me with their two or three year track records based on some blind machine learning thing going, you know, 
So what's in that sample that you're looking at and what's going to happen when the next systemic risk thing hits? So these are some of the questions that I like to ask as we're talking with people. This, this, my friends, is a real black swan. I saw this in person at a zoo in Sydney, Australia. There was only one of them. He's kind of hard to see because it's a murky day and he's in murky water, so even when the black swan's right in front of you, you might have trouble seeing it. And he was alone and he was mean. <laughs> so I can see even the other swans didn't want to be around this black swan. <laughs> And, and what I've pulled together is this is just, you know, from my own life. And it, it's interesting, the financial business is one of the strange industries where as you get older, it's actually valuable. The more experience, the more regimes you've seen, that gives you a better ability to deal with these system of things because you've seen more of them and you're aware of them. So, you know, we've got flash crashes going on. And, you know, I happen to own this low volatility ETF that was down something like 30 or 40 percent intraday for an hour. This is the low volatility S&P 500 stocks. <laughs> and I'm really glad I didn't have some sort of stop loss that took me out 40% down because it then recovered and ended the day higher. But you know, that's an interesting thing to look at for your trading systems. We have the global financial crisis that we've been talking a lot about. Uh, internet bubble, remember that one? You know, living in San Francisco, I got to experience that one firsthand. It's fun on the way up, not so much fun on the way down. There's the Russian default, you know, some Nobel Prize winners kind of got surprised by some of the things that happened there. Uh, Japanese asset bubble, you know, when I was graduating from MIT, we were all supposed to learn Japanese because, you know, this country was being completely bought, especially California. And, I mean, that market's still going down since then. So this is a different kind of crisis that's playing out over decades. Uh, when I was here, we had Black Monday in October. We're like, uh, are our soup kitchens going to open up? Are we going to have a new depression? What's going to happen? And then that one just recovered so quickly that, you know, if you'd stayed out of the market, you would have missed the rapid recovery. These things are not like each other. Uh, there's the, the oil embargo and cars lining up around the block trying to get gasoline. Some of you may remember that. Um, the Dow is struggling to break 1,000 for 16 years. So you've got this very slow inability of a market to actually get anywhere, and it's one of the longer bear markets, even though it was mostly just kind of a sideways period. Then you go back, you've got the Great Depression, you've got bank panics. These things I mostly know about by being a coin collector, because you know they didn't have enough money to make coins in some of these years, so it'll be missing in your series of coins that you're looking at. And the theme here is these things keep coming back. They're not the same as each other. And maybe you want to think about what's caused some of these crises, especially if you're building some really fancy models. Here's some nice public data from the Fed, courtesy of Professor DeModeran, who's very nice to put these things up on the internet. And I'm not saying that short-term interest rates are the most important thing in the world, but here's 90 years, and so they're kind of flat for 30 years, and then they go up for 30 years, and then they go down for 30 years. And one thing I can say is the next 30 years are not going to look like the past 30 years because, well, they can't. For one, if it kept going down, we've got negative interest rates, which is a whole different thing. And so, again, if you're sampling, if this is your data set, you might kind of wonder about some of these other variables and how they might impact you going forward. We found there are some nice uh, frameworks for looking at systemic risk. We like to you know, piggyback on other people's work. And uh, Kritzman's absorption ratio actually works reasonably well for market timing. Anything having to do with market timing is going to be imperfect. You definitely don't want to overmine these things. But we do see you know, there's this nice red region where things were fragile during the great crisis. And of course, what worries me a bit is that you know, the next biggest one is this one that we're sitting in here right now. So are we going to go sideways? Are we going to go up? Are we going to go down? I mean, I don't know. But it's useful to have things like this that you can look at. And we do see that if you use this for timing and we're switching back and forth between stocks and bonds, you would do a little bit better and even better than that on a risk-adjusted return. Then you've got macro models that people are building, and this S-risk thing seems to be pretty popular. And we've had people take our own news analytics and look at sentiment on systematically important financial institutions, and they've come really close to replicating the same curve, which is very interesting. You know, when I see people come from a completely different perspective and use a completely different data source, coming to the same conclusions, I'm going to feel a little bit more confident about what's going on. And you know what this is saying is, yeah, we've got a lot of systemic risk and we should probably be worried about it. 
So now, how can you see these things coming and predict them? You know, we've all heard about big data today. I'll explain a little bit about what we mean by that. So there's text, there's things on the internet, there's these dark corners of the internet people ask us to look in. Transactions, if you could get your hands on credit card data, you can see what's going on at firms as the cash register is ringing and get pretty much perfect insight into that. The question is, well, how do you get your hands on that? What, how do you have to aggregate the data and what are the privacy laws and what are the delays? But there's no question that the economy is putting out tons of information at every point in time. Then you've got the whole internet of things with smart cars driving themselves and every crop has got sensors on it. And sitting right in the middle, you know, if you just could get your hands on everybody's cell phone, you'd know everything about them, which is, again, why we've got all these privacy laws. But there's plenty of information that's out there to mine if you know where to be looking for it. And what we're doing is we're trying to forecast different kinds of events. And this is, I think, something that's really been understudied by the financial community. There are event-driven traders, but they've been focused in on certain ones. And we have entire databases on things like bankruptcies and deals that we've you know, made quite a business out of. But some of these others, you don't really have clean databases on them. So we've got earnings, securities, new products and innovation. There's patents, but patents are really hard to work with, and we're trying to map that to financial data. There's environmental social governance. We've done a good job of seeing what companies' policies are, but we don't really have a database of how much pollution or how many dead bodies or what are the scandals. And we're seeing a lot more interest in that with what's been going on at Volkswagen. And we're seeing people using big data techniques to actually create databases of wrongdoings as opposed to policy statements. I mean, the litigation world is huge and regulation, crimes, you want to take a look at that. Natural disasters, our supply chain people are building databases of floods and earthquakes and tsunamis and figuring out where everything in the supply chain is. So if you've got your hands on that data, you can manage these risks reasonably well, or at least react to them as they're happening. Geopolitical, macroeconomic. So our goal is to just keep going down this list and see which of these things you can assess strong probabilities of something happening here, where you want to look to protect yourself and to continue to enhance the databases so that other people can study them. And I want to leave you with some questions to think about as you're constructing stress tests or scenario tests. So uh, how many rare events have you got? How many actual independent observations are in your data set? And if it's um, none, no crises, or one, at least goes back to 2008, you might start asking yourself how you could look at more of those. So you could look outside the U.S., you know, you could look at analogies from history, you could make up some data based on correlations and putting in different regimes and how they might switch back and forth. Uh, you might go farther back in time. And then ask yourself, are you looking where these black swans tend to come from? Do you have those geopolitical risks in hand? Do you understand how large money flows would affect what's going on? Do you really understand what's going on in the supply chain, you know, first tier, second tier, third tier kind of relationships? And do you see hidden concentrations in your portfolio that don't show up in normal conditions, but very suddenly show up with one of these nonlinear effects as changes happen? And the main thing I want to leave, leave you with is to read you know, history going way back in time. While the internet bubble was happening, a friend of mine told me, hey, you should read this book. It's called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. Like, are you kidding me? There's a book with this name. 1841, okay, South Sea Bubble, <laughs> um, all these things that were tulip bubble, tulip mania, this stuff actually happened. There's stories about it. It sounds exactly like the internet bubble, right? Same thing happening more than 100 years before that went down. It's also interesting to read stories of traders and investors. And one that a lot of traders like is called Reminiscences of a Stock Operator. This is a guy during the 1920s, Jesse Livermore, who made fortunes and lost fortunes and made fortunes and lost fortunes and ultimately killed himself. Um, even when you understand markets, it's really hard to understand the systemic risk that's out there and also the systemic risk that's within you as a trader. And the more exposure you get to different people in different markets, the better you should be prepared to handle those kinds of situations. Thanks.